Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for Strengthening Your Staffing. Today will be a panel discussion from three experts in the field in recruitment and retention of staff and volunteers. And when I say experts, I mean they have had successes and they've had things that haven't worked so well. Um, so really, we understand that this is a huge challenge for virtually all industries, but particularly for our industry. So we wanted to hear from some that are perhaps outside the Aging Nutrition Network to really help us open our minds about ways that we can go about solving this problem. Um, and I'm so excited to bring this to you today. My name is Erin Hoisington. I am a registered dietitian and I am the Nutrition and Aging Content Director for the Nutrition and Aging Resource Center, which I will tell you about a little bit more here in a couple minutes. I'm also joined by my co-moderator, Kat Rudolph, today. Kat is with Iowa State University and she works closely with the Resource Center. Um, and then we have our three panelists who I will also introduce here shortly. I will also let everyone know that we will be saving questions towards the end of the webinar. We do have a time for question and answer. So as questions come up, feel free to type those into the chat or into the Q&A feature. And Kat will be then reading those to our panelists. And we hope to be able to get through all of those this afternoon. Um, if not, um, I don't know, we'll, we'll try to get answers for you, but uh, that's how you can interact with us today. The Nutrition Aging Resource Center recognizes that services are not one size fits all. Therefore, we celebrate the diversity of the older adult population by respecting the needs for those various life experiences. So as I said, I am with the Nutrition Aging Resource Center, Ashland, actually, ugh, excuse me, also known as the National Resource Center on Nutrition and Aging. We are a collaborative agreement between Iowa State University and what was formerly the Iowa Department on Aging, but as of July 1st is now Iowa Health and Human Services Department of Aging and Disability Services, it's quite the mouthful. Um, and we are funded by the Administration for Community Living. We are a resource center that provides primarily resources for Older Americans Act Title III C programs. So those are congregate nutrition programs, home delivered meal programs, such as Meals on Wheels, um, but the resources that we provide many times are useful for those outside of the aging nutrition network. So if you are an attendee from outside the network, which I know I had at least one signed up, I was so excited. Um, please take a look at our website because I really think that you will find resources on there that could be helpful. If you are in the aging nutrition network and haven't looked at our website lately, please do so. We have gone through a complete transformation and reorganization and we have some really great resources that are out there and they're much easier to find than they once were. We have everything from interactive learning modules and our instructional campus on aging nutrition or ICANN. Those are free training modules for Older Americans Act programs that can help you with those training needs as you recruit new individuals or to help you retain those that you have already. We, from time to time, create live events, such as today's live webinar, um, as well as quickeners, which are shorter, 10 minutes or less webinars. Um, and typically we have those then recorded and also available for review on our website. We have infographics, toolkits, guides, and more, everything from food safety to training to business practices. Um, so really, like I said, it's a wide variety of topics and areas that kind of expand beyond aging nutrition. So take a look. A really great way to stay up to date with what is happening with us at the Aging and Nutrition Resource Center is to subscribe to our newsletter, which is sent out twice per month. You can do that by going to our website at acl.gov forward slash senior dash nutrition. And there's a little button there. You can see the arrow kind of at the bottom left of your screen. Or you can take out your smartphone right now and scan the QR code. And that's another quick way to sign up for those newsletters. Additionally, we're very active on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, LinkedIn, Pinterest, and YouTube. So if you prefer social media or do both, you can find us the at signed aging nutrition. All right. So there's my shameless plug for the resource center. If you're not following us already. I hope you are after today. According to an article from the U S chamber of commerce, 50 million workers quit their jobs in 2022. I think we're all pretty familiar with kind of 
what that looks like because we're all living in the midst of that right now. And that's why we're here today. This has been referred to as the great resignation, but really it appears that it's more of a great reshuffling as many of these people who have left their jobs have been rehired in other sectors. We know though from experience that the food service industry has been hit hard and honestly, um, the highest rate amongst resignations is within the accommodations and food service industry since July of 2021 with a rate of 4.9%. So like I said, we know that this is affecting us at rates even higher than some other industries. Now, this may be due to many factors. We know that wages and oftentimes food service industry, particularly in the aging nutrition network or in the school nutrition network, um, you know, paying a good wage, we're very limited in what we can do in that manner. Um, additionally, now since COVID, working from home is a very attractive op option for many people. And so in-person work, such as the programs that we run, can be a deterrent for many because we can't serve older adults or school children or whoever it is by sitting at home at a desk. So these two factors can be tough challenges to overcome. But like I said, that's why we've gathered a panel of experts today who have had to think outside the box and find additional solutions to really help recruit and retain, excuse me, quality staff and volunteers. So let me begin by introducing them. First, we have Anthony Rodari. Anthony's pronouns are he and him. Anthony is an Iowa native and dual citizen to Thailand. Rodari has a Bachelor of Science in Human Development and Family Studies from Iowa State University and a Master's of Public Administration and Human Resources Management from Drake University. Recognized as an inclusion champion and transformative talent acquisition excuse me, leader, Rodari has almost two decades of experience in corporate recruitment across startups and Fortune Inc. financial, retail, internet, technology, and social media organizations, such as Wells Fargo, Target, and Facebook Meta. Most recently, Rodari was the global head of talent acquisitions at Twitter, overseeing early careers and university recruitment, diversity, and inclusion, excuse me, inclusive hiring, events and talents marketing, and internal mobility. After eight years in San Francisco Bay Area, Rodari recently moved to St. George, Utah with his husband, John, and one-year-old Kavapu Tofu. Anthony also has a mean, mean roundhouse kick. Now, he didn't put that in his bio, but um, I know Anthony from some kickboxing that we used to do together. So, Anthony, I just want to take this opportunity to let you know we need to work that into your bio for your next speaking gig. Next, we have Anita Terzinski. Anita is a registered licensed dietitian and is, a, is, excuse me, graduated with her Bachelor of Sciences in Dietetics from Iowa State University. She has 15 years of experience in food service with university and school nutrition at Iowa State University Dining, Des Moines Public Schools, and currently as nutrition director at North Polk Community Schools. That's in central Iowa. She has three children who keep her busy and learning with one Iowa State graduate, and one on his way there this fall and a junior at North Polk High School. She enjoys all things outside and has a new love to visit national parks. This summer, in fact, Anita got to experience the awe of the Redwoods National Park. We also have Gabrielle Glick with us today. Gabrielle is a talent acquisition business partner for Elior North America based in the Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania area. Gabrielle supports a segment of the business known as Trio Community Meals. For those of you in the Aging Nutrition Network, that might sound familiar. Trio provides customized nutrition programs, medically tailored and home-delivered meals, serving seniors in congregate dining settings, homebound, and recovering individuals to meet their specific nutrition needs. So welcome to all of our panelists. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and jump right into the questions because this is really why we're here today. Nobody really wants to hear from me. I'm not that exciting. You guys are the true experts here. So we're going to start out with diving right in. We know challenges are an issue for all of us. Over the past year, what have been your organization's biggest challenges around staffing, recruitment, and succession planning? And what lessons or best practices have you learned in this space? Anita, we're going to start with you coming directly from school food service. Although you're not aging nutrition, um, like many of us are, I think that the roles of school food nutrition and aging nutrition definitely overlap. 
So Anita, take it away. All right, well, hello everybody. Um, I would say the biggest challenges are life is happening for all of us, whether it's um, illnesses within our families, um, injuries with, for ourselves, with children, grandchildren, pets, you name it, things are happening for all of us. So one thing that we have really worked to do is have a deep pool of substitutes that we can call in to help fill those roles when our fully staffed people aren't able to be here. Um, for our bigger job, we have head cooks. We have five buildings that we're covering. We serve about 16 to 1,700 kids a day in five different buildings. And a lot of times if we have a head cook out, that's been a challenge to fill those bigger roles. It might be a little bit easier for somebody to step in to serve on the line or work in the dish room, but knowing that knowledge behind that head cook spot, we have been blessed to hire a person who can be our floater amongst the buildings in that bigger role. And then of course, another challenge we have is we may have somebody who joins us for a month or two months and then realize that it's more than what they cut out to do. And so um, that challenge is, is that you've put in that time and training for that person and then they've ultimately decided that it was maybe more than they had bargained for. Um, so with that, I just have tried in my interviews um, sense to really try and be real about the job, knowing that we're going to be sweeping and mopping, taking out garbage and those things, but then also doing a lot of cross training so that everybody gets to do every role. And so that way, hopefully, um, maybe it's more attractive to know you're going to get to do a little bit of serving and dish room and garbage rather than just not focus in on that one spot. Uh, this year, we work to implement a, um, a strong training program in that, um, you know, as it is, you're short staffed and people maybe sometimes just get thrown into roles, but we've been try we've tried to really um, make sure that we have enough staff there that day if we're even able to send somebody extra so that that new person for a couple of days until they're comfortable has some one-on-one -on -one training. And then... I wrote down one other thing. Um, oh, yeah, we also started where we have people start at one building. So for us, our high school is our biggest producing kitchen. So if we can have people come here and get to work with maybe a little bit bigger team before they go out to the smaller buildings, that way they can see a few things first. And I even today, we did a training for our brand new staff for back to school. And I just figured they're not going to retain everything I tell them today, but maybe planting a seed so that when they do get out to the building and apply it to that that school that it will make a little bit more sense and then one thing that helped us think outside the box was actually our uh, work-based learning class at the high school needed some job opportunities for some students who were getting ready to graduate and didn't have a place to go for um, gaining some work experience so we were able to team up with our special education classroom and hired a student after working with us with their teachers the the year that he graduated and then last year was our first year that we hired him as an employee and then with him came his support person who we saw she was starting to help us a lot too and so we actually went ahead and hired her for a smaller role knowing that she's still here to support him but that she was also giving us a hand. And so that definitely has probably been something that was never written in a job description before, but um, some new things that we've done this year. Excellent. Thank you so much, Anita. And Gabrielle, with your role, um, finding staff for our Older American Act programs, essentially, really is, is what you've been doing. So what have really been the things that you have faced, the challenges, um, and what are the lessons learned? Yeah, so honestly, very similar to a lot of the things that Anita has mentioned so far. Um, I'm sure we've all heard the term ghosting, whether it's with personal or work related, but we have noticed, you know, that happening quite frequently with our applicants, um, whether they've recently accepted the position or just recently after only working a few days, they just stop showing up. And it's unfortunate because we don't really ever get to know why, you know, did something happen? What went wrong? Um, in addition to that, um, as I'm sure a lot of you are using job words like Indeed, ZipRecruiter, Monster, you know, those major ones, candidates have the ability to apply for hundreds of jobs at the same time. And 
you know, sometimes candidates forget what they've applied for. So if hiring managers are reaching out, a lot of times we just don't hear back, you know, or there, there are questions like, who is this? You know, what job is this? So I think just having a smaller candidate pool um, would be an opportunity for this challenge. Um, some other challenges that I'm sure everyone is facing is competitive wages. You know, businesses are, all, we're all trying to, you know, hire from the same candidate pool. Um, so um, that's been a challenge. And then um, working with seniors, you know, and that um, elderly, you know, um, person who, you know, we don't want just anyone going into their home. So with what we do, you know, these these um, employees we're hiring are actually going into homes and senior centers and delivering meals. So there are a lot of times that we lose candidates in the process of doing their background checks or doing their onboarding because, you know, they find out that sometimes we just can't move forward if there are background issues or maybe the process is just too complex and it's taking too long. Um, so that those are just some challenges that we have um, faced, you know, in the past year. And then um, on the flip side, in terms of best practices or lessons that we've learned, um, you know, the quicker you can get back to an applicant, the better. It's an applicant market. And, you know, as we all know, we're, we're all looking at and choosing from the same pool. Um, shorten the application process, make it as simple as it can be. Um, most, a lot of companies are trying to do away with long applications where candidates have to enter their work history for the past 10 years, you know, just make it as quick as can be so candidates can get their application done. Um, something that we've done with TRIO specifically, that's shown a lot of um, internal development for our staff is we have implemented a program called the Frontline, the Frontline Elevate program. And um, what that specifically offers is any of our hourly, hourly employees who are interested in development opportunities or want to do more with us, um, they go through a series of modules, discussions, and um, what they learn in the classroom setting, they can then go ahead and implement in their day-to-day. The program lasts for anywhere from six months to a year. So um, it's not like something that they just do once and then they're automatically ready to go into a leadership role. It's something that they're gonna work at and have meetings with their supervisor and really have a chance to work on what they've learned and practice. Um, but once they actually graduate from the program, they are eligible to kind of slide right into an opportunity that does come up, whether it's something local or maybe something that, you know, they, they're able to relocate for. So it's just a really good opportunity for somebody who does want to do more and somebody who might need just some um, learning to get there. Um, so those are just a couple things that, you know, have really helped us over the past year and um, hopefully are good ideas to maybe implement. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of many of you out there that it's good to hear we're not alone, right? Even though um, sometimes it might feel like we're alone and we're the only ones experiencing that. You heard from Anita that school nutrition is experiencing a lot of these same um, challenges that we are in the aging nutrition space. And I, I know that it's not just us as well. Um, and I think those were some great suggestions and some great ideas that I know I had not thought of previously. And so I hope can be um, kind of spark some creativity for many of you out there. Now, looking at, um, you know, those resources that have been helpful, Gabrielle, we'll start with you, but what partnerships, tools, or resources have been most useful within your organization within this space? Sorry, trying to take myself off mute. So um, as I had mentioned previously, you know, partnering with as many um, job boards that you can partner with to get your, your business out there and get your jobs posted um, has shown really great results for us. Um, we've also recently partnered with um, or before I get to that, you know, a lot of companies have had to go down the temp, the temp agency route to try to find workers. So we have implemented um, a partnership with temp agencies. It's called Answer Team. And it's essentially a third party that is going to handle all of our temp agency contracts and all of our employees, which is going to take that burden off of our managers because managing five different temp agencies is taking them away from their day-to-day. -day. Um, so just kind of 
outsourcing that has been really beneficial for us. If you know that's something that is um, a possibility. Um, other than that, a couple other things that have been really um, beneficial for us is our employee referral program. So, um, you know, the referral program encourages current employees to refer people that they may know to work for us. Um, it incentivizes them because they do receive $300 for referring another hourly staff member as long as they, have, they uh, work 90 days. Um, and then something really unique to our business that I just wanted to bring up is because we are contract food service, you know, we do have nine other segments or different client groups that we work with. So we are piloting another program with our um, corrections um, department. And basically it's a program called Pathways. And it is for those inmates who are about to leave, you know, jail, and they are looking for a different life after they leave. They're looking for a better life than the one they came in with. Um, so what we do is, you know, we are uh, working with them in the kitchen and giving them those skills that are transferable to outside of prison life. Um, after they graduate from the program, they are then placed into a position with a trio position um, with our organization. So just this past month at our Sacramento location, we were able to transition four inmates who graduated from the program and secure a kitchen position with trio. Um, so something really great, you know, that we're able to share within segments. Um, and just one last thing I wanted to mention is community partnerships. So anytime we're able to partner with any sort of community organization, is always gonna be beneficial. And something new that we're looking at in the next few months here is a nonprofit organization called Catalyst Kitchen. Um, what they are, uh, as I said, you know, they're a nonprofit organization that basically run teaching kitchens to end joblessness through food service job training. So um, something really beneficial because it's not just in one area, you know, they're all over the United States. Um, we just started working with them in Pittsburgh, and we are hoping to work with them in some of our other locations as well. Excellent. Definitely some ideas that um, I think we maybe don't think about unless we've had to think about them, right? Uh, my first job out of high school was through a temp agency, and it became a permanent job. Well, I mean, semi-permanent for an 18-year-old. Um, but, you know, I think that sometimes we forget that some of these tools are out there, and so I really appreciate you sharing some of the things that you all have been utilizing. Now, Anthony, we know from your backgrounds that you have a very diversified um, experience in recruitment and retention. And so I know that you also have some great ideas of partnerships, tools, or resources that would be helpful for organizations. Yeah, I was trying to stay under the radar because Gabrielle had a lot of the suggestions that I would have recommended. But anyhow, there are 71 participants. So thank you all for, for joining us and giving me an opportunity to, to kind of share some best practices and some of the things that I've learned. Um, even though I'm coming from the tech sector, I, I, have an, I do have a background within nonprofit um, and human services, which is how I began my career. And I'm actually noticing quite a few similarities with regards to recruitment, staffing, and retention. Um, from a partnerships perspective, you know, Gabrielle had mentioned the agencies to, that have pipelines of, of candidates who would be eligible for um, opportunities within human services or within the field. Um, my heart and my passion is really within early careers, especially uh, in partnering with organizations that serve uh, marginalized communities. Um, there's an organization that's called the Europe. Um, they are an organization that partners with community high schools um, and they have pipelines of high schoolers who are looking for opportunities within any capacity in any field, any industry for an internship experience. Um, I believe if I, if I recall the, uh, the age restriction with regards to uh, labor relations was uh, any, anyone who would, who would be eligible to be like a junior and above. Um, it was a great entryway to get folks to, um, and from a resourcing perspective in terms of budget, um, to get entry-level talent to test try um, what it could be like to work at the organization full-time. It's very similar to partnering with the university. I remember um, during my time at Iowa State University, my uh, sophomore through senior year, I had uh, interned, which was actually a volunteer opportunity at Beloit Residential Treatment Center. Um, loved it, loved my experience, and actually ended up uh, working there full-time for about three years. Um, from a tools perspective, I think, you know, Anita had mentioned something about 
assessing talent and realizing that attrition was starting to increase based off of a candidate's ability to want to do the work or to do the work. Um, I think it's really important that you have tools in place, whether that's through an applicant tracking system that helps you develop behavioral based questions, behavioral based questions or um, situational behavioral interviews are questions that you build when you're assessing talent to help uh, predict future behaviors. So these are very uh, common with tell me about a time questions. Um, I think it's really important too, as Anita mentioned, to be really um, realistic around the job expectations. This is what you're going to be getting into. Um, a candidate is still going to do what they need to do, you know, to be able to impress you in the interview, but the behavioral based questions um, uh, will throw them off a little bit right? You can kind of screen through and assess whether or not someone is going to be able to do the job. And it gives you a very objective way of assessing talent without any bias. Um, in terms of resources, I think the similarity that I see with regards to retention specifically um, across the tech sector and in industry, any industry um, in human services, I remember the uh, turnover with that uh, within Beloit was extremely high because of the work. I mean, you're dealing with um, children between the ages of four and I think 16 that have a wide array of psychological, um, behavioral, and mental disorders. And, you know, the retention was very, very high. Sorry, not the retention, the attrition was very high because, you know, you're dealing with kids who um, need a lot of social, emotional support. But I remember. Um, my team was, ex was extremely strong, and I take pride in, in the fact that it was due to the development that I had um, at Beloit uh, around effective leadership. It goes for the same within the tech sector. So having led a global team across the world at Twitter um, and at Facebook, um, it all came down to effective leadership. Um, some tools that, uh, that, were, that I had used to develop my team in terms of um, keeping folks retained and, and feeling productive um, was getting to understand them at a personal level, but then also understanding their, their styles. Um, there was a tool that was called um, the DISC assessment, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, is kind of understanding how a person best operates and it's very situational. So you might have somebody who is extremely direct. Um, they like to get to the point, they like to do their job, then they like to execute, and that's it. Right, or you might have somebody who's a little bit more um, uh, analytical, and they're problem solvers, and they like to take their time. And you know, the DISC assessment and another tool, which is called Strength Finders, helps uh, individuals understand how they can best work together. So I use Strength Finders um, and another tool called Globe Smart, uh, which is available via LinkedIn to help folks uh, to help my team actually learn one other style. And I had a whole graph that showed. Mercedes was uh, extremely collaborative, whereas Katrina really likes to ex execute. Um, and it showed them kind of the, the median as to how they could work best together. And it helped build some, I want to say, engagement across the team. It helped develop folks who had a potential interest of leading a team. And, you know, that was really, really important. I'm going to kind of tap back on the previous question. I, I think a lot of folks, Aaron, are probably wondering, you know, what were the biggest challenges at Twitter? And obviously it was the acquisition. You know, we had a pretty th good thing going. And then we had the world's richest man come in and want to acquire the organization. So it caused a lot of chaos. Um, and, and that was going to pose for us some retention issues. You know, the, the tech market is extremely competitive. We are competing against talent uh, across, you know, the fan groups, so Facebook, Meta, Google, et cetera. And so being able to retain folks, again, came down to effective leadership. We could throw all the money at them that we could, um, all the perks, but it really came down to being an effective leader. And I think to me, what's really important, both in the tech sector and in human services, is really around providing an environment of psychological safety. And what I mean by that is really, you know, thinking about how you want to go to work each day. Obviously, we all need an income, like, unless you're a billionaire, but it's really important to think about, you know, what drives you to work each day, what's important to you, and apply that to each individual on your team. Um, from a staffing perspective, it's just as important to have a really strong employee value proposition. So why would someone want to work at your organization, aside for collecting a paycheck? Uh, I'll leave it at that. Anything else that I need to add, Aaron? 
No, I hope you all can hear me. Of course, I just get a warning that my internet connection is unstable. And so I even had a few moments where my screen froze up and I couldn't hear everything. But what I heard was dynamite, Anthony. Um, so, oh goodness, I think I'm froze up again. All right, I'm going to step in for Erin um, while her Wi-Fi uh, gets up to speed with what's going on. So hopefully everybody can hear me all right and my, my connection is stable. Um, but we're going to go ahead and move on to our next question. So uh, the question, um, we're going to direct it to you, Anthony, um, and then Gabrielle. But how can organizations recruit quality employees? And I know you all have um, touched on this a little bit, but if you guys had anything else to share. I think Aaron got kicked out and so go ahead and um, move forward. I'll get those slides um, back up, but if uh, I can uh, sit, share the question in the chat as well, um, but how can organizations recruit quality employees, Anthony? Yeah, there's a couple of things that come to mind. I had mentioned it in, in my previous comment around ensuring that you have a really thorough, robust, objective interview format in terms of assessing talent. Um, so you can recruit high caliber talent by asking behavioral based questions to really understand if they meet the qualifications of the job. But to take it a little bit further, I think in this market, you know, as mentioned, uh, depending on which industry you're in, it is a candidate's market. So they can be selective around where they're going to go. Um, I think, you know, the human services field uh, and because this field is extremely niche, we have to think about how you can tap into a, bro a broader range of, of talent and also remove any biases that um, people have around who their ideal candidate is. So um, when you're, I think in terms of writing inclusive job descriptions, that's really important to keep it as general as possible and get really specific around requirements as needed. Um, by making it really specific, sometimes that hurts the recruitment process because you are nearing your pipeline of talent. So if you're hurting for talent, it's best practice to make the job description as general as possible to attract a wide net. You know, the other thing is ensure that you're using inclusive job language. Um, you know, I don't remember the exact stats or the percentages, but when I was building out inclusive hiring and diversity recruiting at Facebook, we took a look at the um, applicant data in terms of representation. Uh, there's a way that you can collect that data based off of self-identification. And what we were seeing was for certain roles, we saw a higher percentage of male applicants versus female ap applicants versus folks who um, were underrepresented or people of color. And the reason why was because the job description was extremely narrow. Um, so if I'm a person of color and I see that on this job description, it says we are looking for a tech rock star who has only worked in startups, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to apply for that job, even though you only need like a year of experience. So um, to recap what I just said, I think uh, ensuring that you have a really thorough, objective, um, behavioral based interview uh, format and assessment tool. And the second piece is around inclusive job descriptions and um, inclusive hiring strategies and process put in place. Gabrielle, anything that you feel like you want to add? I think those are all really good points. Um, something else that I'll just chime in on is utilize your social me social media pages. So, you know, you have those out there. I mean, post your jobs on there, have people share, you know, jobs and what they love about working for the company. Just utilize them to the best of your ability. Um, I, I think something that kind of goes without being said is treat candidates with respect, right? So their time is just as valuable as yours. I can't tell you how many times that um, a hiring manager will come to me and say, hey, I missed the interview or, um, oh, I didn't realize I had that on my calendar. And nine times out of 10, you know, we lose the candidate or, you know, it, it's just not a good first impression. So um, be available, be present when you're interviewing candidates and really just give them your time. Um, and the only other thing that I think I would add to this is simplify your full cycle of recruiting process. Now, sometimes this is not always possible because a system is sometimes not changeable, right? You have to do what you have to do. But I think something that will be really helpful and go a long way is when you hire a candidate, 
ensure that they know what is expected of them during the pre-employment or onboarding phase. So, you know, sometimes they'll get an email or, you know, they'll have to do something online and maybe they're not tech savvy or they just don't really know what is expected of them. Lay it all out there and be available as a resource for them as questions come up through the process. So yeah. I think Gabrielle, I think you brought up a really good point around candidate experience being that it is a candidate market. I mean, there's there are a lot of opportunities where you have too many cooks in the kitchen that are interviewing. And so the longer the process is uh, against the labor, uh, sorry, the, the talent market where there's a ton of opportunities, you know, from a candidate experience perspective, if they're going through an interview process where there are like seven loops and like three people on each loop versus going through, you know, another interview process where maybe there's three with one interviewer, um, the candidate, depending on how they're treated, is likely going to go with a shorter interview process. Um, my, my thought has always been the more interviewers that are involved, uh, the more biases are introduced, right? And that's what you're trying to remove is as many, all biases as possible. So the behavioral based interview format from a candidate experience perspective is equitable and it's objective um, because you're asking the candidate, uh, each candidate, the exact same question. Um, and again, shortening it will help the candidate experience because they're, people are anxious to work. You know, they want to get to work. And so they're likely going to, unless they have the luxury of not working, they're going to go with, with the opportunity that um, not only is it most aligned to their values and and where they want to develop, but likely with the organization that's going to hire them faster. Absolutely. Yep. Spot on. Thank you. Thank you both. And thank you, Kat, for stepping in as my internet decides to do its own thing. Uh, thanks for everyone's patience on that. Anthony, on the last question in this question, you've talked about those behavioral based interview questions. Just a follow up question on that. For those of us that are in attendance today, is that some, I mean, can we just Google that and get some good examples of that? Yeah, all you have to do is just, just go ahead and do a Google search on situational or behavioral based interview formatting. And that should give you a whole rubric of types of questions based on competencies that you can ask to assess um, a potential candidate. So, you know, when I think about, let's say I'm hiring, um, Aaron, can you just give me a role? Just give me something. A cook. A cook. Okay. So if you're hiring for a cook, right, what are some of the main competencies that you're going to be looking for, for your ideal cook in terms of the job skill, right? So uh, a cook is someone, I, I've never hired for a cook, but I'm thinking that you would need someone who is able to uh, adapt, uh, adapt to changes. You're going to need someone who is um, customer service oriented. You're going to need someone who is uh, reliable, right? So based off of those three competencies, some of the behavioral-based questions that you want to apply to each will help you assess if that person can do the job. So for example, from a reliability perspective, a question that comes to mind that is behavioral-based would be, um, can you tell me about a time that you were assigned for a shift, um, but something unexpected came about? How did you go about handling that? What was the situation? How did you go about handling that? Um, and what was the outcome? And what did you learn? That's an example of a behavioral-based question. And again, based off of how the candidate responds, you as the interviewer uh, will be able to assess whether or not they're going to be able to um, meet the needs of, of what you're looking for. Excellent. Thank you. I think it's such a great suggestion. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that we all knew where to find examples of those questions if if we don't have those already in our repertoire. All right. So moving on. Um, Anita, I think we'll come, we'll bounce back to you. What strategies does your nutrition program at North Polk or perhaps you've used at Des Moines Public Schools or Iowa State University? Um, but that you have in place to manage employee turnover and retention, because we all know, as we talked about, right, sometimes they show up for day one and then they don't show up again. Uh, we need to keep them there once we get them there, especially once we get them trained. That's right. It's sure nice when you know your team is coming back the next day. <laughs> So um, one thing we're really working on building um, positive culture around our school um, and also seems like with education, there's a lot around educator wellness. And I know one thing our district is doing this year, they have a book on educator wellness that um, 
everybody is getting teachers, support staff, and reading that. And then we'll have a professional development day in January where everybody will be present to be able to reflect on that. And I know one thing that mentions in the book, and I haven't gotten to read it yet, but is about journaling. So when we all get together here back to school, everybody's going to receive a journal. And I think it just uh, overall talks about taking care of yourself and what does wellness look to, like to you? Is it good sleep? Is it exercise? Is it diet? You know, all those things we hear a lot about, but really to take care of ourselves. And if we're our best selves at work, then we can take care of the people around us as well. Um, I guess I think it was Gabrielle or Anthony mentioned competitive wages, you know, that that helps a little bit, but also the other things as we've mentioned. So that's been one thing I know the director before me had worked really hard at because we're a smaller school north of the metro area. And how do we get the people to come just a little bit further north? You know, it's not as big, but I think having a little bit higher wage has helped us to um, get people in as well. Um, taking care of our staff, this past year we had a few falls, and so um, not only getting into the workers' comp, but also how can we take care of our people better? So we went ahead and got skid-resistant shoes for everybody, so we're seeing how that works. I know everybody was very appreciative when we did that, and then we're looking to do it once a year, and so we'll do that again in January, so we'll see how that goes. Not everybody opted in, and that's okay as people have their preferences for shoes, but it was a thing that I think showed, you know, we do care about you and we don't want these falls to happen. So that was just one thing we could do for our staff. Communication has also been high on our list district wide. And so of course, I'm just trying to take that down to our level. It's um, hard sometimes for our team to have time to get on the computer, but making sure that if I send out an email that it's printed off and given to the leadership in that building so that everybody is staying informed. And then I attended a webinar or actually an in-person training this winter with Iowa school nutrition directors as a way to um, ways to really engage your staff. So engage staff would hopefully keep coming back for you. And I loved um, some ideas that I learned there that I thought I would share with you. So um, gather a list of people's favorites. And so I did this one time at, um, at a, a department meeting where I had everybody write down their favorite drink, snack, how they like to feel recognized outside of money, right? <laughs> We're limited on that, but you know, do you like an extra jean day or a favorite t-shirt day, uh, your favorite hobby and color? And then I was able to use that and even actually when somebody parted ways, um, it was kind of an awkward situation, but um, my office assistant reminded me of these sheets and I was able to take her a bottle of Dr. Pepper and a bag of Reese's Pieces or whatever and say, you know, I wish you well. And, you know, um, it was hard and but she really appreciated that. So not only using that in the happy moments, but maybe I hope that's a good example of how that then was good. Uh, the person who shared the idea um, used it for when she was doing evaluations with her staff. And so she would show up and had their favorite soda or tea or water, whatever it was that they liked. And they were like, how did you know that was my favorite? But, so they, the people may forget that they filled out that information and then you, you can just kind of have that in your toolkit. So that was kind of fun. And then I, I suppose aging resources also has a day where you celebrate your staff. Um, for school nutrition, it's the National School Hero Day, which is usually May 5th, and sometimes the saying is, our heroes wear aprons, <laughs> or don't wear, I'm sorry, don't wear capes, they wear aprons, so here's a picture on here, Erin, um, I had shared with her, and I did a basket for each kitchen, and then there was a cute little thing on Pinterest of, you know, a mint for the, oh, let's see, maybe the gum was for sticky situations, a pen to jot down your ideas, the chocolate kiss to show your appreciation. I can't remember what else I had in there. Maybe a notepad. I think there were some crayons. Anyway, so just getting ideas off Pinterest. I'm not the most creative, but I was able to take that idea and run with it and go to the dollar store. So it didn't cost me a lot, but it, I think the people enjoyed that as well. Another thing I did in the spring was I had some little uh, eggs that I put a little note about spring inside of it. Thank you for growing with us. And it had a little picture of a flower. And then I actually labeled each egg with that person's name. And it was so quiet in the kitchen that day as they were whispering and like, hey, I saw your egg over there or else they didn't, they kept it secret. So having a little fun in the kitchen, that was something that I was really 
excited that people seem to enjoy it. And then they would ask on the side, hey, who, who did that for us? And um, it kind of got them talking to each other as well. And some people are like, oh, I like a good egg hunt, or I found somebody else's, or I didn't get one, you know, <laughs> just some of those fun things. So really connecting with the people, I think, you know, if they feel appreciated, hopefully they're more likely to keep coming back. And then this year, I would like to implement uh, rounding questions. I was doing some research and reading on that from a, uh, re as a suggestion from another person at a nearby school district, but to contact or be in touch with your staff monthly, what's going well, what are the tools you need to do your job that maybe you're missing? Is there somebody in your team that should be recognized? So then I can maybe send a personal letter out to them that says, hey, I was meeting with Kelly and she said, you're doing a great job of connecting with kids every day. And um, just really, I guess, more so acknowledging those things that maybe they wouldn't see that I have seen or knew about. And then um, taking some time with the staff before it's the evaluation time at the end of the year. So that hopefully they feel open and, and able to come and talk to me with, uh, with questions or concerns. So those are just a few things. I'm sure they're, you know, just, just little ones, but hopefully somebody else can take it, take something away from that. Yeah, absolutely. But sometimes, you know, we're all dealing with limited resources, whether it's limited time, limited funds. So it's a lot of times those little things that add up to really build um, a place that people want to come back to every day, or at least don't dread coming back to every day, right? Um, so no, I think those are all really great suggestions. Gabrielle, in your experience, um, you know, what are some strategies that you could maybe share with us to help manage employee turnover and retention? Yeah, so I loved all the things that I need to hit on. I think sometimes the little things are the bigger things and they go a lot farther. Um, but, you know, for our organization, some of the things that we have implemented is recognition programs. So for associates' birthdays and anniversaries, um, they do get sent personal cards from our president and senior vice president. Um, so it's just a little personal touch. Um, we also have quarterly town halls where we um, we talk about, you know, milestones and birthdays and recognize them again on those calls. Um, Anita had already discussed this, but the wellness focus and what we offer from a benefits perspective, just making sure that our employees know that, hey, we have um, an EAP available, we have a cancer support program, we have mental health resources, whatever those benefits might be, you know, a lot of times we go over this at the time of hire, and then it just goes out the window, right? So um, not always maybe when something is wrong but maybe just throughout the year that you you check in with your staff and say hey just a reminder that you know we have these programs and resources available you know whether you share it with yourself a family member you know just want to make sure you guys know that we have these resources for you and then you know a couple other things is having transparent coaching and discussions throughout the year i think it was anita who talked about this not just at the time of re review but um, just making sure that people kind of know that they're doing a good job or, hey, like this is an area for improvement. Um, the review shouldn't come as a surprise. It should never be a surprise. No one wants that. So, you know, just having those candid conversations throughout the year. And then um, we talked about the Frontline Elevate program that TRIO has, um, but maybe it's not a specific program. Maybe it's just having those conversations with staff about what their aspirations are and, you know, what can you as their manager do to help them grow in their career? Um, I think that a lot of people want development opportunities. And one of the reasons that they leave is just because they don't, they either don't see that they have an opportunity or they don't have those conversations with their manager. So I think just showing an interest and really having just a really it doesn't have to be anything formal, just an informal conversation about where that person wants to grow within the company goes a lot, you know, a long way. Absolutely. Those are all great suggestions. Um, thank you both so much for sharing your expertise in this area. In the sake of time, we only have about 10 minutes left. We have one more question and I want to hold, uh, hold a little bit of time for Q&A from our audience. Uh, so we are going to move on to our final question from me for today. Um, I don't know how many of you out there have ever worked somewhere where you didn't feel like the uh, 
organization really fostered a positive and respectful work culture. Uh, I have um, not here. It, things are great at the Nutrition and Aging Resource Center. Um, just want to make that very clear. But I definitely have been in those positions, and it makes um, you know for me a job that I thought on paper was a dream job, um, really not a dream job at all. And obviously, I left that position uh, because of that. So I think that this is so important, and I think that is maybe overlooked at times. I've heard in answers that we've had thus far, some of the ways that this is addressed, um, but really more formally, Anthony, I'd like to start with you and hear from you what ways, what suggestions you have for organizations to really foster that um, positive, respectful work culture and environment. Yeah, this is such a, a complex, loaded question, but I really think that it comes down to an organization's employer value proposition. And what I mean by that is, having a philosophy in place that really summarizes the culture of what the organization is trying to drive and being really candid about what it's going to look like for internal folks, employees, and folks that you're trying to recruit um, can, can, to understand what it's going to be like to be successful there. Uh, I think, you know, I mentioned this before, but effective leadership is so important. I think the a lot of times we promote uh, internally or we hire leaders um, because of optics in terms of the experiences that they that they've had in leading teams. But um, you know, sometimes those folks are not the most effective leaders. They've just kind of been promoted into their fields because they've been doing it for a long time. So really hiring effective leaders who really are passionate around serving others um, who are compassionate and empathetic and um, can tailor their leadership approach to individuals on their team. Um, I think what's important as we think about the future of hiring is, you know, for a lot of Gen Y, a lot of Gen Zers, flexibility and social impact and being a mission-driven organization is really important to them. Um, I think sometimes even more so than, than compensation. And so, all those things in terms of understanding the talent market and understanding the pipeline that you're trying to attract is really important as you go and try to seek out talent to come and work with you. Um, so those are just a few of the things that I think that that we can put in place to ensure that you have um, respectful workplaces. I think having candid conversations, um, we've all learned after the pandemic, a lot of folks are going through things that we, we don't know of and people aren't comfortable with with you know talking about it um you never know what anyone's going through so creating spaces um where folks can be vulnerable if they want to be is really important i think personally for me it's it's having flexibility um you know this market is extremely tough we're seeing a lot of job opportunities out there that are requiring return to work you know, and that's not, to me, it's not inclusive. I, I think that, you know, some folks work best um, if they can uh, working remotely um, versus going into the office. I mean, when we think about like neurodiverse talent, so people with intellectual disabilities, they may not feel comfortable, you know, working in an office. There may be some uh, uh, challenges with the work environment, et cetera. So being really, really um, intentional around your EVP, um, and some of the conversations, the programs that you have internally uh, to ensure that there is a uh, respectful culture. I know a lot of companies and a lot of organizations have like sexual harassment training and unconscious bias, et cetera, et cetera. But it really um, is going to take an effective leader to ensure that they are exhibiting uh, those behaviors and those qualities to ensure that the rest of the organization follows. Excellent. Thank you, Anthony. Um, and Anita, can you share with us wisdom from your experience on ways to foster this positive work environment? Well, sure. Um, so I'm just in my third year as a director role. So in my first year here, I met um, some resistance and my leadership uh, encouraged us to read The Energy Bus by John Gordon. And so it was a very quick read. And so our whole department read it and Basically, we were able then to kind of get together a month later and talk about, so we did do paid time. We gave everybody three hours for reading the book if they read it, and then we talked about it. And basically, you know, that book is great. It talks about a guy on the bus and how he didn't enjoy riding the bus, but then as the time went, he got to know the people around him, the bus driver, and oh, the book I see in the questions, it's called The Energy Bus by John Gordon. Ooh, I think I even have it right here. I can show you. 
Oh, I'm blurred out. Or can you see that? I'll type it in there. By John Gordon, G O R D O N. And it talked about, you know, um, you're going to be on the bus, you're going to be positive and make it work and work with your people around you. Or maybe it's not the bus that you want to be on and then you'll choose to hop off. But um, really, how we treat each other. Um, it was a great book for us. And then we've been able to refer back to that a few times. So that, that's one other little trick we've got. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and I think that really what's important to um, keep in mind here is that it doesn't have to be something um, huge, right? It's when people feel safe when they come to work. Um, it's when people feel like they can be themselves, that they can really optimize the work that they do the way that they do it best. Um, and, you know, that requires sometimes some flexibility. And so I really appreciate all, appreciate all of those recommendations because to have a positive work environment, yeah, we don't have to have, you know, this crazy place where people can come in and like go have manicures and massages during their shift. I mean, that'd be nice. I'll talk to my boss about getting that going. Uh, but I have a feeling we don't have the funds for that either. So, um, Kat, I did make you a co-host, um, but okay. So Kat was going to handle our um, Q and A. However, I'm she having is unable to access too. it. Yes. <laughs> so I will go ahead and take that over. Um, we do have one question in the Q and A. Um, any words of wisdom? And this is open to any of you. For, I'll change my little slide here. Um, any words of wisdom for recruiting older workers? They are often well equipped to work in aging nutrition programs. I'll take a stab at this one if, if that's okay. Um, I think there's a couple of questions that come to mind uh, as it relates to how we hire and, and where we hire. So I would challenge the question as to why. Why are older workers equipped to work better in, in this specific programming? I mean, there are some rules and regulations that prevent against discrimination in recruitment. And so we can't hire a specific demographic. Um, so the reason why I ask, you know, why is what are some of the competencies or what are some of the skills that folks in that demographic, demographic have that make them successful? Does that make sense? Because it, essentially a job is a job. And if you're qualified, that could be any gender, any age, any sex, uh, you know what I'm saying? So I would challenge the question as to what makes older workers often well-equipped to work within nutrition programs and change the bias um, and the kind of philosophy around how you recruit. I feel like, you know, that that's a really good question, but I would challenge the why. And, and, and take it back to the objective of this is what we're hiring for. And these are the competencies, these are the skills um, that make our ideal candidate versus a specific demographic, just because there could be some legalities that come with, um, with uh, trying to profile a specific demographic in, in, in hiring. So, yeah, thank you, Anthony, for that reminder, um, because I think that can especially because we have programs that target vers very specific individuals, then, you know, sometimes that's where our mind is. Um, I do know the individual that asked this question, so I will give a little bit more frame and context around this. I think for um, many programs, this is actually a group of individuals that is overlooked because as society, oftentimes there is this bias against older workers that they are going to not be as good for whatever reason, whether it's a uh, bias against their ability to use technology or, you know, whatever it is, uh, what we have found or what many programs have found across the nation is really not to discount this group of individuals. And so the person that asked us, I'm pretty confident that I'm um, like trying to get across the point that they were trying to get across in that thinking about, you know, you said it best, why are they better? Or why are they well-suited for this um, field? Well, oftentimes if they're retired, they have flexibility, they have availability. And so if we need, you know, that flexibility in the types of hours, maybe we can't offer a full-time position. They might not look at, be looking for a full-time position, but, um, you know, they might want something just to do to get them out of the house, to give them some social engagement. Um, so 
that was a good see that's like the right the diversity equity inclusion brain coming out and then he's like yeah. oh we gotta open so it I, up I, no. but yeah. i know what you're saying absolutely yeah absolutely. i think the deeper the deeper issue and sorry i need i don't mean to cut you off i think the deeper issue is there needs there there needs to be more um I guess, enablement with regards to unconscious bias, because those are the types of trainings that are necessary for folks to understand why they need to be open and inclusive to any demographic, regardless of background for open opportunities. I mean, you know, you said, um, you know, people who seem to be in that demographic are a little bit more flexible and they're open to X, Y, and Z, but so is somebody who maybe not you know, in the older workers demographic, like they're unemployed. So they have all the flexibility in the world. So it's important that we t we keep that in consideration. Um, so it's not super, again, profiling is illegal. Um, so it's just important that the underlying issue here is that there, there needs to be standardized training around unconscious bias and equal employment, equal opportunity employment. Anita, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, Anita. No, that's okay. And I think uh, Aaron had mentioned, you know, maybe it's the the variety of the jobs, you know, um, we have some short shifts and we have some long shifts and um, depending on what people are interested in, I don't know if you guys have flexibility in having maybe three hour shifts versus a seven or eight hour shift. I know that's one thing with school nutrition, we, um, that you know, sometimes we need people for all day, but then when it comes down to serving the lunch over the lunch hour, maybe we need a few more people who come in for just one or two or, three, well, not one, sorry. We have to make it worth their time, uh, come in for three hours to do that meal. I'm having so much fun. I've realized that we are past our time. So I am going to give the opportunity for anyone to jump off, but if any of our panelists can hang around, um, this is going to be recorded. So if any attendees need to jump off, any panelists, that's fine. By all means do. We have a few questions that have come in that I would like to ask if anyone can hang around um, and a resource of slide that these slides will be available online after um, words in our thank you slide. So just wanted to give that opportunity, but if anyone can hang around, um, we did have another question come in um, as anonymous because now they are like, oh, she's going to call out if she knows me. Just kidding. Um, how can I advocate to manage that we need to provide higher pay to our workers? Any recommendations around that? Um, chime in on that one, Erin. So this has come up a lot, very frequently um, across many of our different kitchens, you know, throughout our, our organization. And it just goes back to what we we're talking about with competitive wages. And I think having the data behind it to really come to your leadership team with has been key for us. So, you know, if you have an ERI tool or something that exists within your company where you can view wage data um, and also something, you know, Indeed, right? You can go out on Indeed and kind of just see what other companies are paying for similar roles and just look at it, take a comparison of those, you know, and then coming to your leadership team with that and saying, hey, you know, we've had X, Y, Z happen or whatever the situation is and just give them the hard data that, you know, we have candidates who likely are not working for us because they're going to McDonald's where they can make $3 more an hour. Um, so I think just having the data to back up what you're asking for is really helpful. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question that came in is tips or strategies for recruiting and retaining volunteers. Our agency is a nonprofit. You know, I think I, I would apply the same suggestions. I know, I know that sometimes there are some legalities around how much access or how much transparency we can provide volunteers um, within organizations. But, you know, I'm thinking about, again, my time when I was interning, AKA volunteering at Beloit because there was no budget. Um, what really drew me personally was the mission and the work that I was doing. Uh, and because, you know, the, the folks at the organization treated me like an employee. Um, and so it was really around, again, creating that environment where folks feel respected, they feel like they're making impact and that they're adding value. Um, so be really clear on what the EVP or what the VVP is, the volunteer value proposition is to volunteer your organization. I think that that should help. Um, 
if there are opportunities to convert, like if, if, if they are a volunteer who may be interested in working in their full time, I think having those conversations and advertising that through, um, you know, as Gabrielle mentioned, uh, social media channels is really, really important. Um, and just to bounce off that, we also had a question about creating job descriptions for volunteers. It was stated earlier that for employee job descriptions to keep those more general at times, um, the person in the chat was just wondering if we should also keep volunteer um, descriptions at general as well. Absolutely. You're not going to, you're not going to recruit someone who's going to do free work if the job description is like super narrow. So keep them very, very inclusive, very um, Textio. If you're looking for a tool, Textio is an inclusive job language tool that you can use. Um, it will actually, let's say you, you can like copy and paste your job description into Textio and it will like highlight all of the words that could be adjusted and it'll, it'll give you suggestions as to what words you could use to make it more general or um, uh, less, um, it'll make it more gender neutral. So Textio is a great tool for inclusive um, job language. That's great. I am going to ask all of our panelists to, uh, yeah, any of these that you've mentioned, if you would shoot me a list of them, we can include those then when we put the recording up live um, so that if someone's not able to jot it down today or find it, we can get those links to them um, when we send it out. Um, Textio, I believe, is that what you said, Anthony? Um, yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Awesome. And then kind of along those same lines, uh, another question is tips for words slash language to use to make a job posting more attractive. Textio will also solve for that as well. I knew I know that I don't remember the actual price for the platform, but they do have a trial so you can play with it. And um, to Gabriel's point around providing data to leadership, <laughs> you can say, hey, X amount of organizations are using Textio to create um, inclusive job language, uh, it does help with employee value proposition. But I think what's most important if you don't have the budget is to connect with your, uh, your. I would say most commonly like your, your communications or your marketing team. Um, they will help you with all of the words and, and, and the fluff that will uh, uh, tie to your organization's values so that it's all aligned and it's cohesive that will help you attract talent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. We went eight minutes over, but that's because we have such amazing panelists and content and so many great ideas. And I'm so excited. Um, thank you all for being here today. Like I said, this will be recorded and will be, um, that's why you need to subscribe to our newsletter and or follow us on social media. So when it's there, you can access it, um, but it will go on to our website as well. So thank you to our attendees for taking your time today to come in, to listen, to hopefully gain some new ideas and to ask questions. And thank you so much to all of our panelists. You stepped outside of your comfort zone when I said, hey, I work in aging nutrition. Um, Gabrielle was really the only person that knew exactly what I was talking about. Um, so I really do appreciate it. But she took a chance on me because full disclosure, Anthony and Anita are old friends of mine. Um, so they, I just had to kind of like twist their arm and like guilt them into joining us. Uh, but it all worked because we had such an amazing group and I knew, I knew we had some wonderful, wonderful wisdom here with us. So thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate the advice and we hope to, um, you know, I don't know, maybe hear from you again soon. All right. Thanks everyone.